Three, two, one. He's a hero of mine. He's still at the top of his game, and uh, he's become a friend and a guy that I really, really do love. He's got a new book out also. It's called The Occasionally Accurate Annals of Football. It's with uh, a co-author, Joel H. Cohen, but the guest on the season with Peter Schrager this week, it is an honor. Mr. Dan Patrick, welcome to the show. Are you nervous? A little bit. Okay, don't be. You're used to being asked questions, or now you're doing the, uh, the asking. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> let's break the fourth wall here. Like when you, when your guys first asked me to come on as a guest to your show, it was almost like being asked to host Saturday Night Live or something. I was like, "This is." I've been watching you, listening to you for much of my life, and also throughout my career. And you'd always had everyone else, the Peter Kings and the and the other sports, right? And I was like, "Oh, I got the call up to the big leagues," and I just never wanted to. Sh- Myself when I was on your show, I just wanted to always do a decent enough job where I can get asked back. And now I feel like Seinfeld at uh, the Today sh- uh, the Tonight Show with Johnny. Like I would get the call back, and I've probably gone on like eleven times. So uh, it's really crazy for me to be interviewing you right now. I didn't know that's the goal to not <laughs> yourself, but uh, hopefully you achieved your goal. But no, I I like enthusiasm. I like somebody who's different. You did your homework. The uh, Good Morning Football is a fun show, and. You know, that's that's what you want. You want guests that get your show. Uh, they can play along, and you certainly have, and that's why, you know, we enjoy having you on. And Kyle uh, Brandt as well. Uh, you know, it's, it's just getting fun people on saying interesting things. I appreciate it. Uh, so I'm sure you think I just grew up watching Sports Center, but I actually – it was before that. Like, I don't think people realize that CNN had a powerhouse of a sports – department yeah. and program like i used to watch i think it was nick charles and one of the cellini brothers who was it vince or well, nick there was, who was it? vince but it was fred hickman and nick fred charles. hickman and nick charles right and i would watch them every night on their cnn show and then on the sunday nights they would have an nba show at like 10 30 and it was <laughs> and it had stephen a smith on it before like stephen a smith was like this national guy but I, this is like mid 90s early 90s and you were the dude in the late 80s early 90s on that network that i i fell in love with you then does the cnn sports era of sports tv just get completely overlooked in an espn like you know world that we're in right now yes and i think that at the time when we had cnn sports we were a better sports department than espn was because we had talent uh we also had really good writers journalists because you had to at CNN. Not to say you didn't have it at ESPN, but I don't think that was a priority. I think entertainment was a priority there. And uh, when we did our show, Nick and Fred were as good as any team who's done it. Awesome. Uh, what was the show called? Do you remember what it was called? It, just CNN Sports Tonight. CNN Sports Tonight. And yeah. I was always like, Sports Center or CNN Sports Tonight. And then CNN Sports Tonight, we never talk about it anymore. No. And there were a lot of, there's a lot of talent that came through there. And uh, Dan Hicks, Hannah Storm, Vince Cellini. Gary Miller, Dennis Dumler, uh, Nick and Fred. Uh, and those were the people that were there when I was there. And a lot of people behind the scenes went on to do uh, great things. The person who started it uh, was Bill McPhail, who was the first president of CBS Sports. Huh. And back, you know, he put on the, you know, the greatest game ever played with the Giants yeah. and the Colts. The Colts, yeah. Yes. And uh, he was there for the first instant replay. And, you know, so he was a legendary figure. His brother was the American League president, yes. Lee McPhail. Sure. His dad, I think, uh, owned the Yankee. I mean, it, 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 was, uh, it was great to talk to Bill. And he ran the sports department. And I just remember I was there for five years. And I didn't even have an agent. And, and what happened was I had lost out on a weekend job in Dayton, Ohio. I, I thought I was going to get it. They gave it to Ken Kettering, who was a better looking guy. It's first time, it, like the reality hit of, oh, they, they may not hire the best guy, but they hired the best looking guy. And he was. He even thought I was going to get the job. So I'm devastated. I'm 27. I'm thinking I'm never going to get into TV. I was doing radio, morning drive radio. And I go to Atlanta. A, a, a former girlfriend was down there. And she said, you should come down here. CNN's hiring. I go, I couldn't get a f- job in Dayton, Ohio, and now I'm, I'm going to get a job CNN. at CNN? Ted Turner's not hiring me, yeah. So I go in, I bring an audition tape, oh. an audition tape that didn't get me the job at Channel 2 in Dayton. And I thought, Same okay. One. So the last day I'm there, I don't even know the process, Peter, of how to 
get an interview. And I have I'm, I have no coaching, no yeah. nothing. And I walk in and I go to the front desk, just like anybody else who could walk in. I said, um, hey, is the person in charge of sports here? And they go, well, who are you looking for? I go, uh, I don't know. Who's, who's the head of sports? This is incredible. And they go, hold, hold on. Uh, yes, I have a gentleman out here, and he wants somebody uh, in sports, and uh, I believe he has a resume tag. And then they go, she goes, uh, just leave the tape, and somebody will get back to you. Yeah. I go, well, I'm going back home. And then she, she called back. Uh, to the sports department and goes, who is this woman? That's, this is the life changer. This is <laughs> he's, unbelievable. He's, go- he's going back home. He wants to know if somebody can look at it. And, uh, and so they said uh, back, she goes, um, where are you going? Are you driving back home? Like how far away? I said, I'm going back to Ohio. She calls back and says he's going back to Ohio. <laughs> Bill McPhail happened to be from Columbus, Ohio. Come on. And he said, have him come back. Because I said, oh, I'm going back to Dayton, Ohio. I go back. I meet him. And he puts the tape in. And he watches three and a half minutes. Three and a half of five minutes. Yeah. And then he popped it out. And he goes, when can you start? Dan, I'm about to cry. I love this story. I've never heard this. Have you told this story anywhere? This is incredible. I, I've <laughs> mentioned it. Um, but I, 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 I got hired to do headline sports. Sure. I'm making 18000 I, I took a $10,000 pay cut to go to CNN, yep. but I wanted to do sports. And I'm doing it, and I'm not even on camera. I'm doing headline sports, and I, but I loved it. You know, I'm editing all the highlights, voicing it, and then you, you know, get it over to headline news. Uh, six months later, Keith Oberman leaves the New York bureau at CNN to take a job in Boston. And my boss says, have you ever been to New York? I said, oh, yeah. Now, I, I'd never been to New York. <laughs> I'm from a small town in Ohio. i have never been to New York. And then they go, well, would you be interested in, you know, being the New York Bureau reporter replacing Keith? And I said, yeah. I took the job. I, I went and I stayed in the downtown athletic club, which yeah. is where they the used The Heisman, to- yes. sure. So I stayed there for three months. I was only supposed to stay for a month. But I was so nervous that I didn't. I didn't have enough money to get an apartment in New York. I, mm. and, and so I said, can I stay a couple extra months? And then I did at the DAC. And um, I, I remember that I finally got an apartment. I made $800 a month, mm. and my apartment was 550 So I wasn't really killing it, but, <laughs> I, but I, was, I was covering New York, Boston, Philly, D.C., any story that came up. So I'm covering Larry Bird against the Lakers in the NBA Gosh. Finals. I'm, I'm covering Billy Martin with the Yankees. Yes. Uh, I'm there with the 86 World Series with Bill Buckner and the Mets. I got to cover so many great events just by being up there. And, you know, it really changed my life. And I met my wife at CNN. That's incredible. All right. And, and I, 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 I don't encourage people to lie, but you don't always have to tell the truth. How about that? And, I do. I know. do think there's a message there, though, because you went to Dayton. Yeah. Uh, you know, I went to Emory, which is not exactly a hotbed for sports. Media. I think there's a impression amongst young people in our industry that you have to go to Syracuse or Northwestern or USC, and there's a path. There isn't a path. You have to be cunning. You've got to be flexible. You got to be willing to, in my case, write for any blog that would have you. And in your case, move to any city. You have all these students now at the full cell. Like, what do you, what is your message to them as far as getting into the door? Well, what I wanted to do at Full Sail University, and they have the Dan Patrick School of Sportscasting, your degree is in sportscasting. Your, your bachelor's degree is sportscasting. Uh, we, we want you to understand, you know, how tough this is what you need to know. We want to give you the answers before the test. But as I tell all these students, I can get you over the wall. Are you running when you get over? Are you walking? Are you crawling? Uh, Because this is a, it's the most competitive job field in America, in my opinion, because everybody thinks they can do it. Yep. Like they all sit there and go, I could do, I could talk sports. Okay, you can. What do you do after 15 minutes when you run out of things to say? But I tell my students, we're going to get you ready, but it's up to you. When you go in there, being professional, understanding ins and outs. You may not be on camera. There's nothing wrong with 
you know, being behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. And I brought Gus Ramsey with me, who worked with me at ESPN yep. for over 20 years. And we just get, we, we hire people who have been in the business. You get hands-on experience. There's, there is no faculty that is better and has more experience than mine. Because we have over 200. Factor in my experience than yeah. all, all the people I worked with at ESPN, assignment desk, reporters, producers. You're hearing it from the people who actually did it. And that's what I wanted them to understand. This is the business. If you're lucky, this can be your job. But there's a your full time your first job is being a student at Full Sail University because there's no frat parties. There's yeah. you know, it's it's not socials, it's none of that. You're showing up, this is your first job. And you know, it gives them that dose of reality of how tough this is going to be. And our job is to make it look easy. That's why, like, I wanted to do it when I saw Bob Costas. I go, man, that looks easy. It's not. It's those who can do it really well make it look easy and fun. You could never have a bad day at Sports Center. No one would let you have a bad day because how could you have a bad day? You're doing Sports Center. Right. Well, you can have a day. It's just you can't let anybody know because that was the dream job years ago. Absolutely. Um, so much so that there was an ESPN reality show called ESPN Dream Job. And guess who stood online? Did you with, really? With 200 people in front of the ESPN Sports Zone in Atlanta in Buckhead. And guess who my, my first break was? I waited in that line and I was wearing a shirt that said, <laughs> that said I just want to meet Bill Clement. And it was the most random like ESPN person I could think of. <laughs> the hockey guy, Bill yeah. Clement. I get in there. I'd never done any broadcasting. They give me a quiz, and I got the quiz all right. I got 10 out of 10. And then I got pulled aside by Howie Schwab and Al Jaffe. Yeah. And Howie Schwab was the researcher. And they said, uh, what do you want to do? I said, I, I, I'll do this show, sure. But I, all I want to do is write for ESPN.com. I'm a huge Bill Simmons fan. I love Ralph Wiley. I love uh, the writing. I love reading uh, the Hunter S. Thompson at the time was writing for yeah. ESPN.com. Like, I love it. I just want a chance to write. And then they led me to a different department who were the editors on the website. And it all happened because I wore a terrible T-shirt but stood out <laughs> and waited in that line. And that was the job for me, dream job. Um, for you, you go from CNN, then you get to ESPN. I have to under, under, imagine, you go to Bristol. It's not a huge, bustling metropolis. It's a campus. I have to imagine there's a lot of ego, a lot of testosterone. What's the pecking order when Dan Patrick shows up to Bristol, Connecticut in the late 80s, early 90s? I got there late 80s, March of 89. Okay. And Chris Berman was, he was basically their Mount Rushmore. Yep. I mean, it was Chris. Um, and he probably deserved two heads up there on Mount Rushmore, Tom Mees and Bob Lee. Mm -hmm. And I got there. And, and, and look, I thought what we did at CNN was better than what they did. And um, so I didn't go in there intimidated from the standpoint of, I don't know if I'm on equal footing. Now, people have to understand where Chris Berman was back then. Hmm. I mean, without Chris, you don't have ESPN. You just, and, and Bob and Tom, you just don't. Because they were doing it. We didn't, you know, they probably didn't know who's watching, how many people, like what place they had in somebody's life. But... I got there. They made me observe for three months. You didn't get on air until three, three months, months of watching them. And wow. I would, and I, I kept saying, I, I, I can do this. I know what Guys, I'm doing. I've done it before, yeah. And what happened was I would come in, and Chris Berman would call me the Charlotte Observer. He'd go, <laughs> uh, hey, it's the Charlotte Observer. And all I did is I would sit there from like 5 in the afternoon until midnight watching them put together – you know, Sports Center. They had to, everybody wrote their own scripts, and I was going to do my first show. And I don't know who was going to anchor. I was going to say, me. who's anchoring with you? Chris Berman had just done the eleven o'clock. Yep. He stayed and said, eh, "I'm doing your first show." Hell yes! And I was so honored by that because That's so cool. He stayed, and uh, I just remember he was so loud. When we got on the air, and I, I even said that. I go, man, you're loud. And, and he goes, you can always go back to CNN. And I was like, all right, let's go. I'm all in with this. But the fact that Chris stayed, and I, I never forgot that. I thought it was a wonderful gesture. And then soon after that, I started doing the 11 o'clock with Bob Lee. 
and uh, stayed doing the 11 for 15 years and then decided that I wanted better hours to be a better father and husband and uh, did the 6 o'clock sports center the last three years. Uh, a quick anecdote, and tell me if this, is, this lines up with what you – he was larger than life at ESPN, and yeah. he's still larger than life. We were at the Super Bowl two years ago in L.A., and Kyle Brandt and I are like – at SoFi Stadium on like the outside campus, like outside the stadium, everyone's going into the stadium. We're on the outside, and a golf cart pulls by, and this guy's wearing a. I mean, and again, my 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 memory might make it even like it's like a tall tale, like it's Paul Bunyan or something, but a giant straw hat <laughs> in a golf cart, and I just had to. I'm like Chris Berman, and without even hesitation, he tips the cap and just oh, yeah. ba- and just bows at us. Yeah. And I'm like, That's yeah. it. Yep, that's and then him. I've been in airports with him. You could have Leo DiCaprio. You could have uh, you could have Margot Robbie. The mm-hmm. line of people who line up to say hello to Chris Berman is unlike anything I've ever seen. And he's larger than life. He's probably the first guy who connected with people um, so personally because it was every night. And and think about when you watch TV at night. Are you in somebody's bedroom, their living room? I mean, there's there is a a, a shared intimacy to that, that he's kind of in my room with me. He's taught, you know, people would say they felt like they knew me because I was always in their house. They could hear my voice. And that's the power of ESPN. But Chris is the first guy nationally who was able, I think, to connect with people every single night. And, you know, that made him endearing to so many people. Uh, so then eventually you and Olbermann link up. And I will tell you, uh, we called it the big show. And it felt like rock and roll, honestly, that th- these two guys were, you know, the ones in the back of the class while everyone's in a suit and tie. It was the two of you guys making little underhanded comments. You had inside jokes. You had jokes with the viewers and you guys just hit it off in such a way that at that time in my life, I, I, I'll just, you know, everything's personal with me because I'm an egomaniac. So I bring it back to me. Um, it was Saturday Night Live, and it was the era of Sandler and Myers and Farley and Spade and those guys. And then it was you guys on Sunday nights, and it was like Saturday night and Sunday night. Those were my dudes. Um, nice. Did it feel that way no. when you were doing it? Did we you were, realize the impact you were making on an entire generation? We Later we did, but you have to understand, management did not encourage us. They, they didn't want us to call it the big show. They were worried... And, you know, a former boss of mine said, we don't want another Berman. We don't want somebody who we can't control. Larger than the brand. Yes. And they were worried about that. And I understand that. But Keith and I, we just sort of said, okay, we have to do this in a clandestine way. That's why we had inside jokes. That's why it was sneaky. It was never overt. And I think it made for a better show. It's like, you know, when I used to listen to Howard Stern, when you couldn't say certain words or you couldn't show something. It made it even more impactful. It's like, oh, my God, now I can visualize that. We weren't allowed to be in front of the product. It it was you had to be sort of pick your spots, have fun with it. But Keith was such a wonderful team player that, that he wanted to make a great show every single night, every single night. And... I, we never took it for granted. You never mailed anything in. It was every night. And, and you wanted to entertain each other. That We never knew what you were going to write. I never looked at his scripts. He never looked at mine. Probably 60 to 70% of the show was ad lib. Yep. And we only had you know three camera people and a floor director, and you were trying to entertain them. And we thought if we made them laugh, then maybe the people who were watching. But we never really knew the impact. Uh, until a little bit later on. And then Keith was only there for, I think, five years. Yeah. But it, it, was, it was magic. We never, ever, ever discussed why it works or let's change something. It, it never. Uh, we would type our scripts. Keith would usually type his in 45 minutes. It would take me three hours. And then we would get together. We, they didn't want to pay for a makeup artist. So <laughs> we had to put our own makeup on in the bathroom at 1030 at night, and then we'd be on the air at 11, and uh, then we'd go our separate ways. But when we got to ESPN, we were doing a show. But that was really the in- only interaction that we had. But I liked it because we didn't waste things 
Yeah. You know, we Well, that's we, Kyle Brett and I do the same thing. We don't ever reveal. I don't even know what he's going as Halloween today. Like we don't ever reveal anything. Save yeah. it for the air. Save yeah. it for the air. And, and I like it. the surprise element of it, but it was live. And there's mm. something about doing live, but also we would do the highlights and the fact that we were on at 11 o'clock at night, let's say a game ended at 11 yeah. o'clock or 1107. They'd have to edit the highlights and then bring them in. We hadn't seen them. Sure. So you you're writing a, a shot sheet. Yeah. Get, they give me a shot sheet. They bring it in. I'd be, I can't tell you the number of times I'd be on camera. So I'd be reading the prompter here and I go and uh, Cleveland hosting Milwaukee and Kenny Lofton is uh, having an incredible streak. You know, he's 19 uh, games in a row. I'm reaching out over here off camera to get, and, and let's go, let's go to Cleveland, you know, municipal stadium. <laughs> Boom. And then I look down at the shot sheet and then we start the highlights. Yeah. And just the rush that you would have Such a of it's live and there'd be names on there. Yeah, you like didn't know. Spelling, <laughs> penmanship. And you just go, you know what? And that's why we came up with catchphrases because it allowed you to cheat a little bit. So if there was uh, Greg Maddox, to Mark, uh, you know, 3-1 to Mark McGuire, gone. And yeah. then I would pause because then I could look on the shot sheet and go, M- McGuire's 32nd of the year. Yep. You know, he's got 94 RBIs, and the Cardinals leave 5-3. Five, leave five, so it, it allowed us to kind of gather, and then you could look at the uh, shot sheet. And, and it just kind of helped. And then after a while, we sort of mocked ourselves with, <laughs> Let's come up with catchphrases that are so stupid. <laughs> Give because, me some of them. I because, love these. <laughs> uh, it was cowhide joyride. And I remember, <laughs> okay, it was a home run. And I was like, that's a cowhide joyride. <laughs> and I remember Keith going, cowhide. Like he even said it on the air. It's like, cowhide, what? <laughs> what? And, and, and I just, I got the biggest kick out of we We, we wanted to make each other think, laugh, um, you know, whatever emotion you could get out of somebody. If it was a serious story, you know, you wanted, yeah. you wanted that. Uh, but, it, you know, it, it, it worked. Um, and I remember when he left, I said, you'll never have this again. He had gotten, I think he had gotten bored. I think yeah. he wanted a different lifestyle. And he went to Fox. And I just said, you'll never get this ever again. And, uh, you, you know, he realized that soon after. And I never got it back again. I, I had wonderful people to anchor with. But there was nothing like that with uh, anybody else. Just because, man, when you're on that wire and there's no net, and you know you can trust that person, um, they're just, you know, it, you really build a bond, and, and we certainly had that. It's special. Uh, but then you guys crossed over into, like, beyond just Sports Center here. I mean, the commercials, which you yeah. guys dubbed, this is Sports Center. But then I think a major moment, for like back now every rapper has athletes in their videos and every musician is dating a an athlete it wasn't necessarily the case when you guys were on that hootie and the blowfish video that was major for everyone like that was major can you take us through the impetus and the genesis of that story well i'll go back to the this is sports center ad campaign because that started after keith and i got scolded for basically trying to secede from the union like, hey, where you guys, you know, we were a hot air balloon that was tethered, but we were still drifting pretty high up. And I remember we got called in and management yelled at us. I mean, really yelled at us. And I remember they, did, they wanted us to stop calling it the big show. We wanted uh, every time you go to break, when you're teasing things, we want you to end with this is Sports Center. And I remember when we came out of the meeting and, um, uh, Keith famously said, I'm shell-shocked. I mean, I'm like, I yeah. can't lose this job. I got yeah, I need three this. kids. Got kids the whole thing, yeah. And so Keith goes, fuck them. And I go, what? He goes, fuck them. They're not going to fire us. We'll say this is Sports Center. I go, okay. So this is in the afternoon. We have to do a show that night. I mean, imagine yeah. how we feel. We just got aired out by manager. I've had those talks. It's scary. <laughs> we get there uh, doing the show. We go to break. After like 18 minutes, and then, you know, coming up, and Keith goes, This is Sports Center. <laughs> and I go, All right, it's on. We're and going then, there. And, and then they created the ad campaign. So I go to my boss, John Walsh, and I go, Why don't we promote Sports Center? And he goes, We don't need to. I said, You promote all these other shows, you know, NFL Countdown. 
Yeah. And then he said, all right, we'll, we'll do an ad campaign. And it was called This Is Sports Center. We couldn't get any athletes to show up because you have to go to Bristol, Connecticut. Yep. They don't pay you. They gave you a, a, like a donation <laughs> stipend of $2,000 for charity. Yeah. And I called Grant Hill. I called a lot of people, but I called, called in the favors. Grant Hill and Jason Kidd. And I said, would you like to be in a commercial? Co-rookies of the year. Let's go. Yeah, I know. And, and I, you know, it turned out they both were like, well, where do we have to go? And I go, Bristol, Connecticut. What do we get paid? I go, well, you don't get paid. And thank God they did it. Uh, so Grant played the piano in the lobby when I, I have a bad it. show. He's. You know, he, you dun, got the jacket. Dun, you have dun, the jacket dun, over, yeah, your over my shoulder. <laughs> I remember. And then, and then Jason Kidd, we went to a helipad, and he <laughs> was getting out of a helicopter with his videotape of his game, and here were his, his highlights. And then he was telling us what highlights. Those were the first two, and then after that, everybody wanted their own Sports Center commercial. Um, and then I, I think because Hootie and the Blowfish, they had just broken with Hold My Hand. Yep. I actually ran into – we crossed paths at the Masters. I've okay. known, I've known the, those guys for – it's 29 years now. Wow. But they were too um, uh, afraid, nervous to say hello to me, and I didn't see them there, but they said, you know, we walk by you. And I think it was the 94 Masters, and they reached out and said, would we like to be in the video? Wow. And I don't know if Keith was aware of them or how aware yeah. I was, and uh, I, I knew he was going to have Dan Marino and some other people. And, uh, and then we became friends. So I've been – my 40th birthday, I went to Europe with them for eight days, traveling around with them, London, Scotland, and Ireland, doing Amazing. shows. First time they'd been over there as a band. Awesome. And then my 50th, they came to my house and performed. And then my 60th, I went with some friends, my brothers and Darius, and we went to Pebble Beach. If I'm around when I'm 70, I'm not sure what I'm going to ask them uh, to do, but they'll prop, you know, at least Darius is going to be involved in it because he's, he's been around for a long time. Good friends. So cool. Um, then you get the connection with the Sandler guys, and you're in probably like a dozen Sandler movies. 20, I think 20 or 21 movies. It sounds, that sounds, you know, pretentious that I don't know how many movies, but it's, I think it's 20. I mean, uh, and it's not just you. It's the Danettes. It's all the guys. Yes. Um, well, he's extremely loyal. He, as oh, David I can imagine. I mean, says, look at the guys in his movies. Yep. All of them. Yeah. He goes, Danny, once you're in, you're in. And I, you know, it's like a, a mob family. Like you're in, you're in for life. What was the, what was the first movie you did with him? I did Waterboy. Okay. <laughs> and then uh, I told him I didn't want to play myself. Like, once again, how arrogant. Like, <laughs> right? I'll like... do it. I don't want to be myself. And he goes, all right. Sandler goes, you're Danny McPatrick. <laughs> you're going to be a police officer and wear a mustache. And I'm in the longest yard, yep. and I'm a police officer wearing a mustache. And uh, we try to arrest Sandler at the beginning of the movie. I remember. Uh, I remember. In, all of I, what was the? That's that's my boy. That's you're my great. Boy. <laughs> you're great with that the, one, Samberg. Yeah, he wanted me to be a sort of a Jerry Springer type guy, <laughs> talk show host, and. Um, just go with it. I'm on stage with Dave Matthews, Jennifer Aniston, Nicole Kidman. Uh, I mean, he's he's been very, very generous. I don't know if it's to the detriment of the you know finished product, no, but great. he's been very, very generous uh, through the years. And he wrote the foreword to this book. He didn't even know what a foreword was. <laughs> As I said, Sandman, can you write the foreword uh, to this book? Danny, what's a foreword? I said, you know, the beginning of the book, and you know, you kind of write whatever. And he goes, what am I writing about? I said, I, you can write about your love of the Jets. Yeah. All right. Can I write about how much I hate the Patriots? I said, yeah, yeah, that go ahead. sounds great. He goes, how long is it going to be? I go, <laughs> just go until you stop. And he goes, okay. Next day, he sends me his forward, the draft. And then he, he goes, there. Uh, hopefully that's what you need. And I said, awesome, Sam, man. It'll be great. And then the next day, he texts me. He said, Danny, got to take Tom Brady's stuff out. You know, I, I hated Tom Brady because he was with the Patriots, but I, I don't want to say I hate Tom Brady now, okay? And then I said, yeah, we'll take it out. Don't worry about yeah. it. So it's about his love of the Jets, growing up in New Hampshire, being yeah. a Jets fan. So good. Um, they say that his sets, like when you're filming, it is 
he's so hospitable he's so gracious and it, it it really is as fun as it looks and a lot of times it's in some pretty cool locales do you have a good story about where you went from one of these movies well i went to hawaii um that was for I, just go with it right that was just yeah, you know, just go with it and and it was a big part i mean i had a big part and i'm on stage with aniston and kidman and um i remember the night i got sh- I, I i shot part of my scene um and then uh, Nick Schwartzen, the uh, yeah. comedian. Minnesota guy. Yeah, so Schwarty shows up. He's in the movie. But he goes, uh, uh, Danny, we're going drinking tonight, and I'm going to drink you under the table. And I said, I said, Nick, don't do that. <laughs> don't oh, do and, and he's like, oh, okay, yeah. Th-, you know, I, I said, I said, Schwarty, I, I'll crush you. Well, he didn't believe me. I walk into the bar. It's a Tommy Bahamas bar in, in Hawaii. <laughs> And I, he gets me a mind eraser yep, that is in a tall glass. And he goes, and I said, I said, what are we doing? He goes, we're, we're downing these. I said, wait, we're, we're, we're going to down the whole. And he goes, yeah. And so I down a mind eraser. And then next thing I know, there was another one that came over. And then another one came over. And I go, I said, Schwarty, uh, you know what? I, I owe it to Sandler to be ready to go tomorrow. And he goes, oh, are you being a and you want to? And I go, all right. I said, Here we go. look, if you die, it, it, you ask for this. This is self-inflicted. Yep. Well, we kept going. Next morning, nobody knows where Schwarty is. Mm. Afternoon, nobody can find Nick Schwartzen. Later in the evening, nobody's heard from Nick Schwartzen. I'm getting ready to shoot my scene. Schwartzen comes in, looks horrible. <laughs> Disheveled mess. I, yeah, I mean, he doesn't, he doesn't look good to begin with. But he goes, hey, come here, come here, come here, come here. Uh, you can't tell Sandler. You can't tell. I said, what? Like the principal or big brother or daddy he, or something. He got so messed up, he fell asleep in the uh, sand trap at the golf course across from the hotel. Incredible. Lost his keys. <laughs> lost his cell phone and uh no he didn't lose his key lost his cell phone so nobody could get in touch with him but he comes in and, and he might have just gotten out of the sand trap i just remember i said i said shorty he goes I, I, you're right i won't do it again the next night we went out he didn't have a drink yeah and, you know we went to, uh, to a sushi yeah. place but sandman will always say look just don't make don't make the newspaper don't make the newspaper doing anything and then we went out with dave matthews uh, first night I was there, and I'd never met him, and yeah. he, he, wicked sense of humor. But he didn't know; he knew no sports. He doesn't know like South African like cricket or rugby or anything. Knew, no, no, I don't think he knew anything. <laughs> Not and, the Ernie Els guy. <laughs> <laughs> but he he goes, uh, yeah, I, I guess you're the sports guy. I go, yeah, I'm a, I'm the sport. Sandler would always introduce me as the sports guy to yeah. to Aniston. Hey, this is Danny's the sports guy. Uh, Kidman didn't care; she couldn't no. care less no, about no, me. No. <laughs> but um, I, I'm sitting down at a large picnic table at a restaurant, and I went to – I'm across from uh, Dave Matthews, and I reach out to shake his hand. I knock my beer over yes. into his lap. Perfect. And he goes, wow, that's uh, quite an introduction. <laughs> and uh, he, was, he was great. Yeah. He was so much fun. And, uh, like, he would always walk up to me, and he goes, you're pretty tall. How tall are you? <laughs> well, they – in the movie, there's a, a scene where he says something about he that guy up there on stage is pretty tall. <laughs> it's like in the movie. <laughs> yeah, it was just Sandler left it in there. Uh, Aniston was wonderful, spectacular, uh, funny, gorgeous. Uh, Nicole Kidman had just had a baby, mm. and she was in incredible shape. But she was an actress. Yeah, I know that's a thespian. Like I couldn't, I couldn't yeah. go over there. She's in and, her and character she, role. Yeah. So, uh, I, I, I was trying. to to prevent them from figuring out too soon that I didn't know how to act. That was my goal. And it didn't take long before Kidman's, you know, sizing me up and realizing this guy is not an actor. Yeah. Aniston may have been a little more generous, but I thought, God, if I ever get alone with Kidman, I- I'm not going to have anything to say. Yeah. Well, I'm thinking I'm not going to be, you know, off the set, you know, talking to her. I'm in the uh, green room of sorts for actors who are ready to do their scene or waiting to do their scene. I walk in and Sandler's bulldog is in there, yeah, and uh, you know some sporting event is on. So I sit, 
got Sandler's bulldog with me, and Nicole Kidman walks in. <laughs> Well, it's one of those where you walk in a room and you hope somebody doesn't see you and then they walk back out. But she walked in and then we made eye contact. So she had to stay. So she comes over and sits down. Nothing's being said. (laughs) Just silence. It's, 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 It's excruciatingly quiet. And I just... And my daughter said, hey, if you ever want to bring up something, an icebreaker for Nicole Kidman, I've got one. Um... You know, I'm born on the same day as her daughter. And I'm thinking, okay, Sweet. if I ever need it, it's in my back pocket. Well, first thing I say to her is, uh, hey, um, you know, I, 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 my daughter is born on the same day as, as uh, your daughter. And she goes, oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> that's it. That's it. We, we, had, we had nothing. We had nothing. Well, a couple of days later, <laughs> Keith Urban, her husband, comes yep. to the set. He sees me. He wants to talk about the Dan Titans. Patrick, he, let's uh, talk. Yeah, yeah. And, and her look on her face is like, you know this guy? Yep. And all he wanted to do was talk about Tennessee Titans. But Sandman does have, you know, it, it, it's usually good locations and fun people. Uh, and, and it's you get things done, but it's, you know, you're having fun along the way. That's really important. Um, we only have a few more minutes for you. I want to ask you a couple, couple other quick ones here because the Sandler connection is one thing, but you've also been on the Simpsons before. And I think that's a good segue to the book. Uh, how does this book come together and your experience with the Simpsons? What's the connection? Well, Joel Cohen, who co-wrote this with me is one of the head writers on the Simpsons. And he reached out to me and said, Hey, uh, we have, uh, an episode where we need an announcer. And uh, it's Homer's involved in a rock skipping contest. And rock thought, skipping. <laughs> yeah. And so I said, oh, I'd be honored. I'd love it. And uh, so they, uh, he said, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll set up the script and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll do a, uh, you know, some kind of uh, moment here where we, uh, we record it. I go, okay. And he goes, you know, while I have you, I, I, how do we fix the Jets? And I go, well, how much time do you have? And he goes, no, I think I can fix the Jets. And then he, he brought up the butt fumble. Why is it, you know, uh, all the blame goes to Mark Sanchez and not the offensive lineman who was blown up by Vince Wilfork. Yeah. So these were things that were bothering him. And then, you know, he would talk about the Patriot mascot, Pat the Patriot. Like, all of these things. He goes, I don't have an outlet like you do. <laughs> and, and I go, and then I threw a couple of things back at him. And then it, it was, it, I, I liken it to, it was verbal tennis match where we're yep. just throwing things back together. And he said, I'm going to write these down. He goes, would you r- want to write a book? And I'm thinking, sure. Like, yeah. And then I didn't realize, but he said, he sent some stuff back and he goes, all right, this is what you said. This is what I said. And I think we got somebody who will publish this book. And I go, what? <laughs> what? Oh, why? What? I, I go, does America need this? He goes, well, football books are always serious. They're about men. They're about, you know, integrity. They're Tradition. You know, yeah, yeah, they're gladiators. And he said, let's just have fun. You know, like, let's talk about Ken Stabler smoking uh, bacon-wrapped cigarettes. Like, you know, <laughs> that's his diet. Let's, let's compare Tom Brady's diet to Ken Stabler. I, I said, all right. I said, I, I, and he goes, we don't have to be accurate. That's. You know, it's the occasionally accurate. So we're not burdened by truth. We don't, but we we do represent every team. Uh, we look at the decades. We look at football, what it'll be like in 2073. And it was just, it was just fun. He's an extremely bright guy. And it just made the process so much more enjoyable. And then I do the audio version. So if you want a bedtime story, yeah, I'll, I can read this to you and, uh, that was a fun pro. There were like we we have something on uh, Nipplegate, yep. with uh, Justin Timberlake, and there Jerry were a few Jackson. of them that I and Andy Richter wrote. Uh, uh, he wrote uh, a story, part of the chapter, Conan's uh, sidekick, and, yeah, yeah, and sure. then Joel started telling his friends. So his friends go, "Hey, I, I got, wanted, I yeah. got a story." So I mean, I was like, I can't turn this down. I'm going to write a book, but everybody else is going to write the book for me. 
And, uh, you know, we just sort of, there was nothing that was off limits. We just thought there, there would be something, if something was funnier, then we took out something. But it, it was, uh, it's been rewarding. It's been enjoyable. And, uh, you know, Joel has become a friend uh, as a result. And it's in black and white, right? And it yeah. aesthetically looks really cool. Yes. Um, I love that. Uh, but we do well, like the Wizenator, Ontario Smith. Yeah, I remember Ontario Smith, Vikings running back. Couldn't yeah. get through that airport. That was uh, unfortunate. Uh, we, um, fix, we fix penalties. Uh, let's see. Things you don't bring to a tailgate. We made the Immaculate <laughs> Reception a sermon. Uh, yeah. We do talk about... Uh, we have people who uh, critique me in the media if okay. I'm any good. Um, and, and so there's trash talk. Uh, I mean, there's, there's, there's quite a few things in the book, but it's, it's meant to be tongue in cheek, but, uh, and hopefully people take it that way. But it, it was, and every team is represented and some of the best players who have played for these teams. We have fun at their expense. Uh, in closing, I got this podcast here as like a second or third gig and I love it. It's like my own name on it. It's the first thing I've had that it seems like everyone's got a podcast. Everyone thinks they can be Dan Patrick. <laughs> You've seen the explosion of podcasts and you know, the explosion of McAfee and you name it. Now there's, you go on your Twitter feed and it's a different young woman touting gambling tips and it's her own show. Like it's, it's everywhere. It's become yeah. an explosion of talent facing like here's my takes on this and that and there's an audience for it did you ever imagine it could explode like this and our industry would go down this direction well yes and no because if you could do a 24 hour seven day a week sports channel and then another 24 hour day seven day a week sports channel and then another then yes that that the explosion could be there because there's only so many radio outlets for people. Now you give them an opportunity to have their view of a certain sport or sports or whatever it might be. I just worry that, and it's going to sound like get off my lawn. No, let's go. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, trying the same boat. Journalism. Yeah. That's because everybody thinks where in the mid nineties got to have a catchphrase to be a sportscaster. Now you have to have a hot take to be mm -hmm. a, a sportscaster or podcaster. I just want to make sure that, because a lot of people will be loose with language. They'll say, you know, I'm hearing, or, yeah. and, and, I, and I'm hearing gets left out where Peter Schrager says. You could say, hey, I'm hearing, and then all of a sudden it's, no, Peter Schrager says that uh, the Raiders are moving on from Devontae Adams. Sure. They don't, they don't listen all the way, and therefore it becomes a story. And I always caution my students, have a source, don't be afraid to have a second source. When we were on ESPN, we had to have two sources. If you had a story, and as, as crazy as this is going to sound, I was on vacation with my wife, and sitting next to us was Tony Dungy's agent. Mm -hmm. And he said, hey, uh, did you hear that uh, Tony's going to get the Tampa Bay job? And I go, No. He said, no, I'm on vacation. And yeah. I, I thought, well, let me call into the assignment desk. Sure. I call into the assignment desk, and they, it might have been Steve Perisman was the okay. guy, maybe. Right. And I, I just remember he needed another source. You're and like, I, God, no, 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 the agent just. But I couldn't tell him that I'm getting it from the agent because yes. the agent said don't attach my name. And I'm going, I, I have I, an unbelievable source. And then he said, I need a second source. They got a hold of Andrea Kramer, mm -hmm. and Andrea was able to confirm it. And then Andrea, I think, broke the news. But I'm like, oh, I'm on vacation. I don't even I don't, want this news. It's just I, in my lap. I'm doing no, you a favor. I'm not an insider. I'm I just nothing out of you, this. Hey, yeah. Tony's going to get the job with the Buccaneer. And I just remember it's like, holy shit, I don't want to work this hard at a story I won't get credit for. Yeah. I don't want credit for it. I want just us helping to get out. credit for it. But you know, I, I caution those who do it that don't, don't be afraid if you're going to say something that you have something to back it up because everybody can do the following. Oh, you know, a source told me. Well, I don't have to tell you my source, yeah. but you hope that people are still going through the process. And look, I, I came up with CNN and this is the way you did it. And I'm going to go out that way. You can't be loose with, oh, I'm hearing. 
Well, I I feel fortunate enough that I spent 20 years having to do sources, and that by the time I say something on air, you're not questioning that process. A lot of times now, I see people saying stuff on air, online, and I don't know who this person is. I don't even know what this Twitter handle is. I don't know if to believe it or not, and the check marks are all askew. Yes. So I can't. So it's very complicated, especially. You know, when it talks to off season stuff and trades and rumors, because then I'll hear from the GMs and coaches and be like, I read this from this Twitter feed. I'm like, I don't I don't know who that is. I don't even know who the person is behind that. Yeah. Someone said it. Well, this is the era of anonymous reporters. Yeah, that's which means, another thing where you're going. I, I don't okay, know who that. I don't know who the reporter is, but they're <laughs> breaking this story on Tom Brady. And then you yeah. have to follow that story. And then you have to figure out, is it true or not? And is this then, a real person? Yes. And if somebody has an opinion, we had Rick Neuheisel on, and I said, where is Jim Harbaugh in a year? He said he'll be in the NFL. Well, that's just his opinion. Yes. It's not Rick, like he's reporting that. That's not Bruce Feldman saying that. Yes. yes. It's Rick Neuheisel said he thinks Jim. But that's how it when, – when we think that people go, they'll obviously know that, hey, I'm saying this in jest, or uh, I'm, I'm just – telling you something that's my opinion it becomes you know the truth and then it's out there and then all of a sudden people run with it and you're like hold on like you can't bring it back and i I know i i hope that people who do this understand you can have a hot take uh i like to have an, uh, an informed take it may not be hot but if it's warm great i hope it's accurate more importantly you're amazing. You're awesome. I feel like we could do a part two, and we haven't even talked about your interview prowess. And your we can do a part two whenever you want to. Peter. We'll do it. Yes. Um, yeah. So appreciate your time, guys. Everyone who's listening, the and book. Jamie, Jamie's uh, pregnant. Yeah, Jamie's prego. Um, that's awesome. She told us that a couple of weeks ago. We're like, okay, that's amazing. And she's like, but I don't know how to reveal it to the audience. So today on thing on Hank on Halloween, she dressed as Rihanna, Rihanna. who. Yeah. Of course, perform the half time. And then she kind of dropped the bomb on the audience and is like, and yeah, just like Rihanna, I'm pregnant. And I'm like, okay. Yeah. She's awesome, by the way. Yeah. Amazing teammate. Yeah, I, I never cool. met her. Uh, and I've talked to Kyle before. And, uh, I, you know, his angry runs are uh, epic. Yeah. I, 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 I worry that he's going to. Yes. Something's going to happen. Like, he's not a. Something's going to burst. Yes. Yeah, yes. That's, yes. Uh, <laughs> Dan Patrick, such a thrill. Um, thank you so much for joining the show, man. Peter, thank you. And uh, I'll be watching.